you know? Follow your instructions. So Ben, let me know whenever you're ready to get going. Oh, we're good. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Good to see you guys tonight. And uh, look, we thought we had some technical difficulties that were going to prevent us from live streaming tonight, but got those taken care of like at the last, literally the last minute. And uh, so we are good to go. Glad to see you guys. I don't know if this means anything. I'm, you know, felt like we were just about choking on all this stuff right here. But today is uh, National Heimlich Maneuver Day, so <laughs> somehow we just electronically saved ourselves there and <laughs> got everything out. <clears throat> yeah, it was it was on this day like in the early '70s. I forget the exact year that the Heimlich Maneuver was first published as a life-saving event. So. Has anybody ever actually had to use the Heimlich Maneuver for real? Three, four people? On you or somebody else? Two other people. You've done it twice. Oh, okay. Well, so if you're an EMT, yeah, that yeah, that, that uh, stands to reason. Well, I, did, I had no idea we had so many Heimlich veterans in, in here. I feel, I feel much safer now if only I was eating something. Uh, <laughs> If you are indeed watching at home, sorry, I don't know if there's anybody at your house that's ever done it before, but if you were here, we'd be we'd be good to all covered, all taken care of. Um, another thing, it's, okay, today's June first. Another thing, it is today. It's New Year's resolution recommitment day. So you know the idea is this: it's been six months since January first, and you know how many of y'all had New Year's resolutions? Okay, and how many of you have kept to them? Okay, the one person who had them has done that. That's <laughs> so, oh, well, it's only five months. It's June 1st, you know, whatever. It still is, the, the idea is that you probably, if you've made New Year's resolutions, you probably have let them fade uh, by now. Because sometimes, after even though despite our good intentions, willpower fades, doesn't it? Um, and this happens not just in our New Year's resolution commitments; it also happens sometimes in our faith. Genesis chapter sixteen. And we are continuing our study in looking at the life of Abraham, father of nations. And uh, as we get to tonight, we're going to see that uh, Abraham and Sarah's faith needs a little recommitment tonight. They've done pretty well for the most part to this point. Uh, when we get to chapter 16, uh, Abram is about 85 and Sarah is about 75. It's been roughly 10 years since they have made their way from the homeland back there in Haran in the land of Ur to Canaan. It's been 10 years. And as they get there, 10 years since God's promise of a of a land, 10 years since God's promise to, to uh, bless Abram with countless numbers of descendants, uh, which of course had to begin at least with one child. Uh, it's been 10 years since all those promises, that covenant that God made with Abram back in Genesis chapter 12. And after all these years, and while they do at least see the land, they've, they've been introduced to the land, and they're living in Canaan by this point in time, they have not seen anything remotely close to kids uh, just yet. And the, re the reality is they are beginning to waver. So let's read Genesis chapter 16. Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, Behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be upon you. 
I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your maid's in your power. Do to her what's good in your sight. So Sarah treated her harshly as she fled from her presence. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will too, so they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahiroi. Behold, it's between Kadesh and Berhad. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for tonight to be able to read your word and to do so uh, with freedom and a measure of, of, uh, of joy as we gather together. I pray that, Father, as we gather, as we study, as we read, that your spirit will speak to us and give us insight into who you are and to what you're doing even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, in chapter 15, we saw last week that God had... Uh, reaffirmed his promise to Abram that he'd given some years before. And in fact, we saw God and Abram even go through a very much of a formal covenant process. We saw the, the, the vision where God and Abram walked through the divided up animals and the sacrifice and uh, very much a form of, of covenant or contract you might have seen that day between kingdoms. And so we see God give uh, Abram more detail and go through a very formal covenant process with him there in chapter 14 or Jared in chapter 15 now we don't know exactly how long it's been between chapters 15 and 16 probably somewhere around five or six years give or take a year or two uh, so at the very least it's been about by the time we get to chapter 16 about 10 years since God originally showed up to Abram and about four five six years between the events of chapter 15 and chapter 16 so that to be said it has been a few years now, in the, in the historical scheme of things, in, in, in world history, is 10 years a very long time? Well, not really. But if you are living your life waiting for a promise to be kept, is 10 years a long time? It certainly is. Um, and I think if, any of, us, if any, of us were the situ any of us were in that situation where something had been promised to us, it had been 10 years down the road, we'd be a little bit unsure about what's happening. And so that's where Abram, and that's especially where Sarah is at. Um, God had reaffirmed in chapter 15 to Abram that his heir would be his own blood. Um, if we were reading through the story of Abram so far, we might have thought originally that Lot might be a, a solution to the problem, but that's dismissed pretty quickly. Um, Abram is concerned that maybe uh, someone in his household, like Eliezer, probably a servant, might in fact have to be the heir. But God says, no, it'll come from uh, your own body. It will be your biological heir. So as we come to chapter 16, the first thing we are told is we have been reminded almost every time Sarah is mentioned in these first few chapters, she is mentioned as Sarah, the one who can't have kids. I mean, it's just like, boom, boom, in case you forgot, red neon lights, she can't have kids. It's who she is. It's, it's kind of her identity at this point. And so, she comes up with this plan, and as bizarre as this plan may seem to us, in the day and age that this story is taking place, this is a fairly common, or at the very least, a fairly accepted practice. Uh, the idea is this, that Hagar, who they probably got from Pharaoh when they were in Egypt before, uh, early on, um, that Hagar is essentially her servant, her maid. She's, we will go so far as to say the word property, but she belongs to Abraham and Sarah. She's part of the household. 
And the only things that Hagar could ever really do is what she's been told to do. She belongs to, to, uh, to, uh, to Sarah. And as such, in this case, um, they don't have obviously modern technology the way we do here, so the closest thing we might think of today would be a surrogate. Um, the route is Hagar can go in and have a child by Abram, and because Hagar belongs to Sarah and is Sarah's servant, if Sarah wants and if Abraham agrees, whatever child Hagar has will be considered not only Abram's legal heir, but also be considered Sarah's as well. That's the way the laws of that time worked. So the plan that Sarah comes up with here, while it may seem strange to us, is actually uh, an accepted, legal, logical, for that day and age, approach to the problem. Can't have kids. It's been a long time. I'm past age where it can't happen. We don't have an heir. This is a legal, accepted way of dealing with the problem. So well, they, they have this problem. No kids. No son in particular. So how do you deal with it? This is the accepted human, cultural, accepted way to deal with that at this point in time in history. This is a logical solution. All right. So before we you know, kind of go off on it too much, we have to understand that this plan makes sense in that day and age. It's what you would come up with. Now, that being said, um, what's happening here? What is causing Sarah in particular to approach Abram with this solution? What's Sarah thinking, do you think? It's taken too long. Maybe we misunderstood. There's, there's all different kinds of ways to think about this. And again, I think if we're in Abram and Sarah's shoe, we might be thinking the same thing. We have a promise. God has said that he is going to make you the father of a great many descendants, a countless number uh, based upon the metaphors that God used with Abram to this point. And, and Abram, maybe God, having made this promise to us, wants us to be involved in the solution. Abraham, God made this promise to us. Nothing's happened yet. Maybe the promise will be fulfilled if we get involved in the solution instead of just kind of waiting and sitting back for God to do something. Y'all ever heard the phrase, God helps those who help themselves? By the way, is that found in the Bible anywhere? No, of course not. In fact, it's patently unbiblical, but it's a good American aphorism, but it's not biblical. But there seems to be a sense of that going on here. Can you imagine yourself thinking, well, okay, this is something that God has said is going to happen. It's been 10 years. Nothing's happened yet. Maybe it's not so much that God can't. Maybe God, maybe God wants us to take some initiative here. And this is a logical way to go about it in that day and age. So we'll do it. God helps those who help themselves, right? So, they do. <laughs> um, now, again, the plan makes sense in their world and in their day. And doesn't God want us to do things that are sensible as we serve Him, to, to work for His benefit, to work for the kingdom? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i mean as, as we look through this and of course we, you and i we, we know the rest of the story i know so we know this is not how god intended for the promise to be kept but if you're in abram and sarah's shoes you don't know the events of the next coming years you're just living through this the way we live through things. Is it so hard to believe that someone might think along those lines? Are there times? Yeah. This is true. Uh, I, I didn't point that out, but I, I do have that in my notes. I just didn't mention it. But yeah, you're right. God told Abraham it would come from him. It didn't say it would come from them. <laughs> he never mentioned Sarah specifically. You know, it's, do we not even today, so often in going about what we call the Lord's work, 
take the initiative to do things that make sense to us from a logical point of view. Well, of course we do. So sometimes we want to help God out. So we know that, for example, in the, in the case of the church, we know that Jesus says that he will build his church, right? But what do we want to do? We, we, we want to build the church now, too. Now, and by building the church, we, we realize we're not talking about a building. The church is not a building. The church is the people. And so, um, now, you know, we, we got to be careful here, don't we? When we talk about building the church, what are we talking about? We're talking about doing things to get people to show up and see people say all those things. Does God want us to do those things? I, I, I'm going to assume so. But what happens if we decide to do things from a purely human point of view? I, I had a, um, when I was a seminary, a long time ago, <laughs> um, we had uh, a, a increasing and growing number of international students at seminary from different parts of the world. And some of them were coming from parts of the world where there was at that point in time in the mid-90s, real revival, churches just exploding and all kinds of things happening around the world. And they would come to the United States and they would get involved with the American churches. And of course, we're there in, in, in northern Kentucky and southern Indiana. And it was kind of interesting to hear some of them talk uh, I had to, uh, I'm going to quote someone quoting somebody. I, I, I was talking to a professor at seminary one day, and he made the comment that one of these international students who he had in the class told him, I'm amazed at how much you guys get done here in the United States without the Spirit. And the, 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 the context of that statement was where he came from, their staff or their churches literally spent three to six hours every morning praying before they would dare do anything throughout the rest of the day. He said, generally speaking, their staff was at the church by 5 or 6 a.m. praying for three or four hours before they ever even did, open so much as open up, a, uh, have, have made a phone call or had a conversation or made a visit or anything like that, opened up the Bible to study for a sermon. And he goes, and generally most of churches had every night of the week prayer meetings led by their Led, led by the elders of the church, and people would leave work and come to the church and pray. It wasn't for worship service. They would pray because they really felt they could get nothing done if God didn't do it. And he says, you guys get a remarkable amount of stuff done without the Spirit being involved, without prayer. He never seen any of it. He, he said, it's amazing how much you guys could do without, without the Lord being involved. <laughs> now, that's a bit of a sarcastic statement, but what makes it ouch is that there's probably some truth into it. Um. Abraham and Sarah have a promise that they know is from God. And maybe on the one hand, we could say they're questioning God's faith or, or they're questioning God's word. But maybe on the other hand, they just think there's supposed, supposed to be something that they're supposed to do for God. And this plan in their culture and their time and history and their place actually makes sense. Now, again, you and I know that's not the, they're not doing what they're supposed to do here. They're taking an initiative that's really not theirs to take. But if I'm going to defend them a little bit, this is, this is, this is how we would do this. Um, now, clearly, Sarah did not think this all the way through. <laughs> and, and, of course, neither did Abram. So uh, they, they go through with the plan. And sure enough, Hagar gets pregnant and no sooner than she does we see a couple things take place one is that hagar having become pregnant now begins to look at sarah differently and it says here that sarah says that hagar has and it confirms that hagar has in fact now that she's pregnant and sarah's not she is looking down her nose at sarah now sarah is the she, she's Abraham's wife. She's the, the matrons of this, of, this, uh, of this clan. And yet, Sarah doesn't have any kids. And now, Hagar, this probably much younger um, uh, Egyptian servant, now she has accomplished what Sarah has never been able to accomplish. And she's, Hagar, feeling superior. Now, what would cause her to feel or despise or look with derision towards Sarah. 
She is carrying the heir. She is carrying the one that Abraham, she's carrying Abraham's child, something Sarah could never do. So she's feeling right off the bat, she's feeling, I'm more than you are. I can do things you couldn't do. Now, in addition to that, how was, in fact, Sarah says this directly there in verse 2. Um, uh, she says, the Lord's prevented me from bearing children. And there's probably, a certain, to a certain degree, that might be right. How would a woman of that day and age in history have been seen by the people around her if she could not have kids? Useless. Okay. Okay, so she's, she's, she's got no purpose at this point in time. Even beyond that, even, uh, and we see this in the story of Samuel, which takes place much later. If you don't have a child as a woman, you are seen by those around you as cursed by whatever deity you believe in. It's, it's a curse. So from Hagar's point of view, she is now done or is able to do what Sarah has never been able to do. And she could even think to herself, yes, I may be the outsider here, but I'm God's blessed and she is not. And so whatever the, whatever the, 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 the thinking might be in Hagar's mind, she does in fact begin to look at Sarah uh, differently. And Sarah, of course, notices it. Now, it's also possible that whatever Sarah's perceiving may be an exaggeration. It might well be that Hagar has a little bit of that, but it also might just be that Sarah, having actually seen Hagar pregnant, now gets a little upset and goes, what was I thinking? <laughs> and there just may be a little bit of jealousy on Sarah's part. That's a distinct possibility as well. But despite her servant status, Hagar now feels superior, or I'm sorry, inferior, and Hagar now feels like she's got the step up. She's... Uh, taking the superior attitude here. By the way, one other thing just to point out here. Is there any evidence that Abram and Sarah went to Hagar and said, hey, we have a plan. Would you be willing to participate? No. She is property. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's not, one, she probably hasn't, she hasn't been allowed to marry. She, she belongs to Sarah as her servant. And now she's told this really old guy over here <laughs> is going to come in and you don't have a choice. You're, you're going to do this. So, you know, Hager's feeling pretty powerless going into this whole thing, I would imagine. And yet here we are. Um, she's got to do what she's told. By the way, it's a little interesting note here as, he, as we go through this, you may have noticed already, that the only time her name is mentioned is by God or a narrator. Abram and Sarah never refer to Hagar by name. They always call her the maid servant. Your servant, my servant. The only person that addresses her by the name Hagar is the narrator at the interest at the interest of the story and the messenger from God. Nobody else even addresses her by her name. So it gives you an idea of how Hagar is looked at by the people around her. So, you know, Hagar didn't have a whole lot going for her. And by the way, that's going to be, I, I think it's an interesting point here we're, we're going to get back to here in just a moment. So as, as a result of all, as a result of the success, Sarah now is resenting Hagar, feels that Hagar is mistreating her because of pride on Hagar's part. Now, Sarah is angry. She's hurt. She's angry. She's probably jealous. Uh, all the things she thinks Hagar feels about her, she probably does, in fact, feel about herself. That just is, that's just probably likely. And so Sarah goes to Abram, and she's mad at Abram. And she says there in, in, uh, uh, in verse, verse 5, the wrong done to me by you. <laughs> Abram, you wronged me. I gave her and I gave Hagar to you. You got her pregnant. And now I'm despised. Abram, this is, you did this to me. <laughs> now, <laughs> you can assert any number of comments here, I'm sure, that it's going, going on in your own mind. 
But Abram, I'm going to sum up Abram, verse 6 is, is Abram's response. He says, your reign yours, is in your power. Do what you want to. I'm going to simply sum up Abram's response. Honey, your maid, your problem, you deal with it. Don't put this on my, don't put this on my shoulders. This was your idea. She belongs to you. You're a problem. You deal with it. Abram, an understanding husband. Now, to, to a degree, he's correct. <laughs> now, let me just let me just ask you a question. This obviously, you know, if you're Abram, you're 85 years old, and your 75-year-old wife comes to you and says, okay, here's this young Egyptian girl here, go. Abraham goes, okay. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't pip a fight. Um, now, we know that this was not the right thing to do. We know that as logical as this plan seems on a certain level, especially for that day and age, this was not the way they were supposed to handle things. This was ultimately going to be a sinful situation for a number of different reasons. Can you think of another story where husband was just kind of quiet and cooperative while the, while the woman got him in trouble? Now, I'm not trying to pick on women here. I realize <laughs> I'm really not. But there's, there's, this feels like the Adam and Eve story to a certain degree, doesn't it? I mean, there's, you know, Eve says, hey, I got an idea. Let's do this. And Adam is there knowing better but doesn't do anything about it and just kind of goes along with it. And Abram kind of feels like Adam here a little bit. Either way, this is the problem. So the, 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 the long and short of it is, Abram says, you take care of it. She, she belongs to you. So Abraham, or, or Sarah, uh, just says, treats her harshly. It's actually a, a fairly violent word. It's, it's a, um, uh, it really has the idea that she just began to, um, it, 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 it's the same word that you'll see in Egypt when the people of Israel are, uh, being uh, enslaved by the Egyptians. It's the same word to describe what the Egyptians did to them to what Sarah did to, to Hagar. So I don't know that she was being beaten or anything like that, but at the very least, Hagar has moved from you know perhaps an esteemed uh, first servant status to now she is, she's dirt, and she's being treated incredibly poorly. Uh, everything Sarah could do to her, she's doing to her. To, to make her just feel like dirt. She's doing it. She's, she's making a point of it uh, to the extent that Hagar, who's pregnant, feels that she has no choice but to strike out on her, on her own in the desert and probably try to head back to Egypt. Now, how desperate do you have to be in this day and age as a woman by yourself, pregnant, to strike out on what's going to be a week's journey, a, a week, week, several weeks journey through the desert back to Egypt, which you haven't been to in 10 years. How desperate do you have to be to get there? Because I'm, I'm going to assume she's been pregnant long enough to be showing and dealing with real pregnancy issues at this point in time. In addition to that, if you are a woman by yourself on the trade routes and just walking, are you, are you the most safe at that point in time? No. The, 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 the thing that, that Hagar is doing here are the acts of someone who's desperate. She's been driven to the point uh, where she may well think, and we don't know this, so this is a little bit of speculation, I get this, but she may well think that her son's not safe. Um, at the very least, she thinks she may not be safe. For all she knows, once the baby's born, Hagar may be gotten rid of in a very difficult manner, and the son kept and she's gone. So whatever's going through her mind, she takes an incredible risk to her own safety as well as the safety of her unborn child to get out of there. That's how badly Sarah is treating Hagar. So Sarah comes up with the plot, <laughs> doesn't like it when it works. Hagar aggravates the situation, does not necessarily act right either. But the result is so bad that Hagar is essentially run off and, and takes it, leaves it great risk to herself and to her unborn child. 
Now, while she's running away, and, and by the way, the indication to her is that uh, where, where she gets to the spring on the way to Shur, this is most likely quite, a, she's been on the road, so to speak, several days. She's, she's not just around the corner. She, did, she, you know, she didn't go three hours down the road. This, this, is, this is a ways down the road. Verse 10, the angel of the Lord, uh, or, or I'm sorry, verse 7, the angel of the Lord comes across her. Again, now the, the, the angel of the Lord does in fact address her by her name and gives her that chance to tell her or for, for, for Hagar to say what's happening. Um, and then Hagar says, this, this is who I am, this is where I come from, this is why I'm here. And the first thing the messenger says to her is, go back. Um, probably not what Hagar wanted to hear. Now, I, that being said, I don't know how maybe her trip's going poorly. I, maybe that's a bit of a relief. You ever found yourself in a situation where you kind of knew what you needed to do, but you didn't really want to do it? I'm sure the answer is yes uh, for all of us. And he said, you, you, you got to go back. You got to go back to your mistress and you have to submit to her. Now, why would the idea of submitting to Sarah be so difficult for Hagar? Sarah hasn't been treating her fairly. Now, that being said, what did Hagar do as well? Yeah, H Hagar got proud looking at Sarah as well. So this, uh, this instruction to go back and to submit yourself to her authority. It may well be that once Hagar got pregnant and kind of got feeling good about herself, she may well have begun to flaunt her position and kind of defy, kind of, you know, kind of challenge Sarah. Yeah, you may be the official wife, but everyone knows I'm really the one that's giving him the heir. So really, I'm the one. I'm going to take your place. I think there's probably a little bit of that going on with Hagar. She's seen herself to a degree as Sarah's replacement. And Sarah's like, um, no. <laughs> and so, yeah. No, she doesn't know that. That's, that's true. We, we know that, but yeah. It is a daughter. Well, in, in a sense, um, but you know, get pregnant once you can do it again. So, um, either way, yeah, they, they don't. She doesn't know it's a son yet, but she is having a child, and she's doing something Sarah can't do, and so she sees herself. It would appear that this is part of what Sarah's problem is that Hagar is seeing herself as a possible replacement for Sarah. This is kind of how Hagar is seeing herself, most likely. This is why Sarah is so upset, because the disrespect that Hagar is showing her is, is listen, I'm the one, I'm, I'm, the, <laughs> I'm his wife, you're just the servant girl, and Hagar's going, yeah, not for long. <laughs> and Sarah doesn't want to put up with that. And so it, neither one of them is, is a, you know, neither one of them are right where they need to be. And what God... What, what the God through the measure tells Hagar is go back and assume your rightful spot. All right? Uh, go back, submit to her authority. So in a sense, I would say that means stop disrespecting and challenging and subverting Sarah's position. Go back. Um, now, there, there could be some other things that wrapped up in that that we weren't going to get into uh, tonight, but Go back, he says, and, and, and take your rightful spot in the household and submit to her. Um, uh, next, he says, he's going, he makes her a promise. And um, he says to her that her descendants are going to be also greatly multiplied. So 
some of the same promise made to Abram is now made to, to Hagar. Well, this, is, this, is, this is a fascinating thing. Um, and goes further on and, and gives more detail. It gives, even gives a name for the son. Because now she finds out, Greg, you're right, now she finds out she has a son. And his name will be Ishmael. By the way, the, the name Ishmael means God hears. And this is really, I think, the key, th- a key thought for us uh, this evening. The next phrase, you shall call his name Ishmael. That is, God hears because the Lord has given heed. In other words, he's heard you. You remember, and the world's are reversed. Right now, the Egyptian Hagar is being oppressed, if you will, by, the, by, by Abram and Sarah. You know, a few hundred years down the road, it'll be the other way around. It'll be the Egyptians oppressing the, the, the Hebrews, uh, Abram's descendants. And do you remember when, when God shows up to Moses in that burning bush and says, okay, I, something has happened and God is going to call Moses to be the instrument by which he delivers the people of Israel. And God says, I have heard the cries of my people. It's the same phrasing. Hagar has been heard by God, and her son will bear the name that says, God hears. Now, goes on to say in verse 12 in particular that uh, her son Ishmael is going to be um, difficult to get along with. And probably, and you may have this depending on which uh, study Bible you have, it says the end of verse 12 says he will live to the east of his brothers. You may have a little note there that says it literally has the idea it, it may that he will live in defiance of or in the face of his brothers. In other words, really, it's probably better translated um, everyone's hand will be against him and he will live in defiance of, the, of his brothers. In other words, he's not going to get along with anybody. <laughs> They're going to aggravate him. He's going to aggravate them. He's going to bother them, and they're going to, and he's going, to, you know, they're going to bother him. He's just, this is who he's going to be. But you'll have a great many descendants. It says verse thirteen. She called on the name. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. Now again, it says you are. It's you are a God who sees me. But the word can also be translated here, and I'm going to, I'm going to favor that translation because Ishmael's name means. God hears. And she gives God a name. You're the God who sees. You're the God who hears. Who wasn't even calling her by her name earlier in the chapter? Abram and Sarah, who she's been with for probably around 10 years, don't even call her by name. They just refer to her in the third person all the time. They don't consult her. They don't talk to her. They just call her by her, her, her name. Oh, that's the maid. She'll do what we tell her to do. The only person who ever calls her by name is God. The one who's listening to her, she's had this done to her. She didn't volunteer for this. She's been told what she's going to do. And who hears her? Not Abram, not Sarah. God does. There is a reminder here to us that even when we feel like we are on the outside, even when we are on even when we're the victim, even when we're sinning, when we're running away and think no one's listening to us, when no one hears us, God hears. Hagar is not from the line of Abram. She's not going to be a, quote, descendant. The covenant God made with Abraham is not made with Hagar. She's already on the outside looking in in that sense. And yet, God, God heard. God sees her. God notices her. I, I, to me, that, that's something we don't want to just walk past. Um, I want to take just a real brief moment. Um, I don't, I, I'm going to, this, this has been stewing for, this has been brewing for a little bit now. Um, Obviously, we are a Southern Baptist church. I don't know how many of you guys have followed the events of the Southern Baptist Convention on a national level over the past few months, especially the past few weeks. A week ago, a little over a week ago, well, there has been, without getting into a long, long, drawn-out thing, there has been a source of, of concern within the 
Southern Baptist Convention at the national level. We have something called the Executive Committee. The Executive Committee is essentially, they handle all the money we give to the convention through our cooperative program that we give to the state, goes to the National Convention, funds everything from IMB missionaries and North American Mission Board missionaries to help funding the seminaries, things like disaster relief, all those things. The Executive Committee is the group of folks that make sure that money goes where it's supposed to go and make sure it's, it's it, it, that, that's, that's, their main, that's their main duty, is they, they make sure the purse strings go to where they're supposed to go. And they're decision makers, and they, they kind of do all that stuff. There have been accusations, and over the last uh, few years, uh, a, a substantial amount of evidence that uh, members and, uh, of the executive committee at the national level, including some past Southern Baptist Convention presidents, have been covering up systematically accusations of sexual harassment and assault by people in the ministry at the, at the national level. Um, this really began to be noticed about four years ago, even though there have been rumblings about it beforehand. A year ago, at the National Southern Baptist Convention meeting, which is essentially just a giant business meeting, <laughs> the messengers of that convention told the committee we want an independent outside investigation done. That investigation took place beginning in October of last year and finished, and the report was given and was published about a week and a half ago. And it detailed, it gave evidence of over, by space to start from 2001 to last year, that there had in fact been a number of different, a number of different individuals, and it named names, <laughs> didn't name all names, but it named some of the names, Sigel said that the executive committee had in fact been guilty of covering up, not only covering up valid accusations of sexual harassment and sexual assault by people who were in higher up levels which is something uh, from time to time or even when ministers had been accused, uh, but had actively also at times uh, shamed and blamed the victims. Uh, there was one event about three years ago where the at that point, the current president, four years ago, I'm sorry, four years ago, the person who was the president of the executive committee at that point in time had uh, assaulted a woman. She came forward, made the accusation known to the executive committee, and the guy resigned, but he was it, it was publicized that he resigned because of an affair. When in actuality, he had assaulted a woman. And the executive committee knowingly misled the press and put out a false story blaming her. Now, all that came back, and they didn't get away with it. All that happened. So last week, the report came out, and obviously there is a great deal of, um, this has probably been, I don't think, I don't think, I think it's fair to say it really is on the same scale as the, as the Catholic priest scandal from the 1990s, but it's the next level below that. Uh, and there's been a lot of consternation, a lot of concern, a lot of ramifications that may end up coming as a result of all that. I, I say that, not to uh, throw the SBC under the bus. They've <laughs> dug their, some of the leadership have dug their own hole here, to say the least. But that being said, one of the things that's happened here is this. We forget sometimes, we've had leaders and we've had individuals forget that God hears the Hagars of the world. Doesn't shame them, doesn't blame them for things that were done by somebody else. He hears them. It's vitally important that we as a denomination and we as a church hear as God hears as best we can, listens, and is a place of safety. Hopefully where those things never happen to begin with, but if they ever were to happen, to be a place where they're safe and not further victimized. Um, this just seems a good place to come. I want to put that in there. Uh, this, you may or may not be aware of all those things. I know there's been a lot of conversation. It was on the national news in different places last week, in particular, when, it, when the report was first put out there. So I want you to know where I stand. I, I, I think the report uh, may not have been perfect. Uh, there may be some things that we don't know for sure what all the details were, but by and large, that report seems to have been done right, done well, and there have been some things that as a convention, as a denomination, we're going to have to deal with the ramifications of in the coming year or so. But that being said, 
if we as God's people aren't willing to deal with sin, why should we expect the world to want to deal with sin? Um, we need to make sure that we are as a church and that we are as a denomination. We are as more so than even that more that we as believers and followers of Christ and believers of the one true God treat one another the way God has treated us. And um, Hagar found a place of safety. God heard her, made a promise to her that she would have a son, that he would, uh, whatever else he may be, that she, this was going to be okay. Um, to the point that she sets up a place of, she, she worships, she calls upon the name of the Lord, and she says, this is a God who has heard me and has seen me. I have not been overlooked. I have not been cast out by this God. And she's able to go back. Um, and what couldn't have been, e what couldn't have been uh, easy either, she clearly, she's gone back, she goes back to verse 15, has the son. Clearly she has told Abram this story because it then says Abram names the son Ishmael. And so clearly she knows, she's told Abram what God has said and Abram has believed her. Um, and at that point in time, by the time all this happens, by the time she's, the plans have been hatched, by the time uh, Ishmael's born, Abram is now 86. And he has a son named God Hears. Um, I think that, you know, there's two things. That, one is we have to make sure that Abraham and Sarah had one job. And that was to trust God. And let God keep his word. Doesn't mean they didn't have things to do. They, they were, they, when God said go, they were supposed to go. When God says do this, they're supposed to do that. They're, they're supposed to trust and obey. That was a song, right? Trust and obey. That's their job. The moment they went beyond that and took matters into their own hands, problems ensued. Even today, God saves. Our salvation, our resurrection, those are things that we don't do for ourselves. Those are things that God does. You and I, our job is to abide, to trust, to believe, to do what he's told us to do. Everything else is on him. It's not our job to do God's job. And then two, if we ever find ourselves in, in Hagar's spot, if we ever find ourselves when we feel like no one's watching us, no one's listening to us, no one's paying attention to us, I want us to know this, this evening, God hears God listens, God sees, and hopefully we as a people do the same thing. You've been watching tonight, so glad you have joined us, and uh, appreciate you being with us tonight. We we'll want to invite you to be here Sunday morning, uh, this coming Sunday, of course, Sunday morning worship service, everything going on, 9.30, 10.30 like normal. Sunday night, Vacation Bible School kicks off. It's going to be a blast. Looking forward to it as we kick off the summer, uh, of, of, a summer of ministry. Very excited about it. Hope we'll see you Sunday morning. Hope we see you on Sunday night. If you're watching with us online, y'all have a good evening. All right. So let's take some time to pray here. Um, things you guys want to pray about, prayer requests, thanksgivings, praises. What's on your heart tonight before we pray? <laughs>